So we're now going to be starting the Economic Justice and Degrowth session, Designing for Equity. My name is Sophie. I'm the Operations Manager for uh, Kind Enterprises and New Kind Conference. We've got a bit of a different format for you for this afternoon's session. We've actually got three different speakers who will all be giving their own talks. So we're going to start off with Dean Foley, Hello. who I'll introduce you to in a minute. He'll be speaking on the decolonization of economic justice. We'll then have Dr. Catherine Trebek speaking on new recipes for a new kind of economy. And then we'll have Dr. Sabrina Chikori speaking on degrowth, a tangible alternative. I also just want to say, um, now's a good time to use the Hoover app because we will be having a panel discussion after these three talks with Dr. Catherine Trebek and Dr. Sabrina Chikori. So please, if you have any questions that come up whilst these talks are going on, all you need to do is go to the agenda section on the Hoover app, click on this session, and there's a specific tab for Q&A. And you can enter your own questions in that. And on the panel, I'll be monitoring that, and um, I'll pick a few from the list to ask our panelists. Okay, so let's get into it. So our first speaker is Dean Foley, who is the founder of Barayamal. Dean Foley is an internationally recognized expert of First Nations entrepreneurship. His passion and commitment come straight from his identity as a Camilleroy man from Gunnada, New South Wales, and from his love for his people and his vision for how to help them build a better world for themselves, and in doing so, build a better world for everyone. This vision is why he started his company, Barry Amal, which is now known as being a leader in the world for First Nations entrepreneurship. His history of service to his community began when he served as a National Guard member and during his time in the Royal Australian Air Force. And he has continued to prioritize work that allows him to give back and make a real difference in people's lives. Through this, he learned valuable lessons in teamwork, problem solving, project management, and leadership from his time in service and from his educational and professional experiences, which allowed him to identify and target the best ways to give back to his community through successful business ventures and consultancy work. Beautiful. Beautiful. We can see your screen and we can see your face. So over to you, Dean. Yeah, yeah. Firstly, thanks for having me and congrats on the success of the, the event, you know, six years running and uh, I'm sure the participants are getting a lot out of it. Um, so, yeah, decolonization of economic justice um, is pretty much it. So this is a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. Decolonizing the economy, Indigenous West, Western entrepreneurship, the main problems uh, with Western management of Indigenous nations and the uh, United Nations Declaration of Indigenous People. So who am I? Uh, I think you talked myself up really well, so there's not much to add there, but yeah, served five years in the Royal Australian Air Force and grew up in the Aboriginal community in Gunda, New South Wales. Um, also started Barry Yamal after leaving the Air Force. I wanted to learn how to run and grow businesses, thought it was very interesting. And during that time when I left and was learning about entrepreneurship, I, I went to organizations that were supposed to support Indigenous entrepreneurs. And, and to be honest, I thought they were kind of hopeless. And then I got invited to Australia's House Startup Weekend through the University of Queensland Accelerator Program, iLab at the time. Went to that, thought it was pretty cool. Thought, you know, why not do an Indigenous themed um, startup weekend, which there never was at the time through Techstars. So, you know, a couple of months later with no event experience, we went to the world's first Indigenous themed uh, startup weekend, which had around 100 people attempt, at least on the first day. Um, and then, yeah, from there, it was just a snowball effect, uh, knowing that you know, you know, there wasn't really much support for Indigenous entrepreneurship. So again, without the experience, ended up founding Barry Yamal in 2016 and, and running the world's first Indigenous business accelerator in collaboration. Um, I can't, sorry, I can't remember them from the top of my head, but yeah, around the world's first indigenous, indigenous business accelerator with around about five Indigenous entrepreneurs and kind of took off. Um, from there, we've done a lot of things. I was even in you know, Victoria uh, running Indigenous entrepreneurship programs. For example, we're working with the Wurundjeri mob on uh, feasibility of native bush food. So I put together a first draft and then I was able to get one of the big four accounting firms to 
reluctantly come on board for free and, and provide pro bono support to the Wurundjeri to take things to the next level. And I think they got funding of that too. And yeah, we've ran a few events there um, around Indigenous entrepreneurship. And um, at this moment, I'm focusing on the lottery, a charity fundraiser um, to raise its money so we can you know, start doing a lot more programs and, and create a bigger impact through Indigenous entrepreneurship. You can also read a whole bunch of uh, articles, all right, because it's only 15 minutes, but I dive a bit, uh, dive into it a bit more and the articles are right for NIT and on LinkedIn. So yeah, I'm gonna try and be um, Roadrunner, my spirit animal for this presentation, quickly breeze through it, um, because I told Sophie I only wanted you know, to have a chat for 15 minutes, um, partly because I'm ADHD. And but when I started doing the presentation, just before I jumped on, I'm like, holy crap, there's heaps of stuff I want to talk about. So you're just going to breeze through it. So feel free to, you know, jump in any questions or just virtually slap me if I'm uh, just talking too much. So, yeah, decolonizing the economy. Um, it, you know, it isn't a new idea. It's been on the tables um, for a long time. A lot of Indigenous people obviously, you know, care about their sovereignty and um, everything that's happened and, you know, they don't want to give that up. But it hasn't yet um, made, made it into reality fully for Indigenous people. And uh, so, yeah, the decolonisation process of Indigenous economy is a process that will allow for the restoration of Indigenous relationships to the land and its resources and the economic system would be based on values such as you know, self-determination, um, not being micromanaged by the government, sustainability for the environment and the um, social sustainability, etc. And we'll allow for First Nations you know, relationship with non-Indigenous people, uh, which would be mutually respectful more uh, without First Nations rights uh, being um, you know, taken advantage of or dismissed. So United Nations have been doing a lot of decolonized work um, since, you know, it was founded in 1945. Before then, some 750 million people, nearly a third of the world's population at the time, well, not too recently, uh, lived in territories that were dependent on colonial powers. And since its founding, the UN has been engaged in decolonization process around the globe. And that work is led by the Decolonization Unit in the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. So that doesn't necessarily uh, talk about Indigenous, which is why this new charter came out a few years ago, United Nations Indigenous People Declaration. And according to the June Oscar, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. She, she thought the declaration is the most comprehensive tool we have available to advance and protect the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I use the declaration as my guide as Social Justice Commissioner. So it's, you know, it's a massive uh, thing at the time, despite a few nations um, going against it and voting against um, the Charter, which included obviously us, Australia, um, which doesn't have the best you know, history uh, working with Indigenous people. Also Canada, surprisingly, New Zealand and United States in 2007 when it was put across. Um, some of the absentees, which I thought was ironic, um, well, one of them was the Russian Federation, but what I thought was ironic was Ukraine and Georgia, which obviously were invaded by um, Russia, you know, recently and had their sovereignty and rights as, you know, first people questions. So, um, but yeah, so that's basically it, um, you know, decolonization, what it's about, um, giving, you know, the rights, um, basic human rights back to Indigenous people and respecting their sovereignty and way of life, culture, et cetera, law. Um, so Indigenous first Western entrepreneurship, um, uh, you know, it's been around for a while. Indigenous people have been around for a while and they've done a lot of stuff. And, um, you know, part of that is like fire stick farming, maintaining large areas of land through controlled burning, which, you know, probably would have benefited a lot, um, Australia, you know, benefit Australia a lot through like uh, the massive bushfires we've had recently. I can't remember the name. Um, also down in Victoria, you've had 
the oldest agriculture structure system that which was used to farm fish and uh, eels by the Aboriginal mob down there, um, which is amazing. I think it goes back to 6,600 years ago. So, you know, we didn't invent the wheel. Um, you know, there's a few racists and bigots and <laughs> I'm sure none of them are at this conference, but they always say, they always troll um, saying, yeah, but Indigenous people have been around for so long, you know, and they didn't invent the wheel. Um, yeah, we didn't invent the wheel, um, but we did invent, you know, the oldest agriculture structure in the world to farm fish and eels. And um, yeah, and Europeans didn't in, in, invent it themselves. Um, you know, the first uh, wheels which were used to port pottery was founded in, you know, 4,200, 4, 4,000 BC, um, which is, you know, in modern day Iraq um, and a few other nations around that area. So it was, it was actually, the wheel was invented by the East technically. So, um, yeah, so the, obviously there's a lot of differences between the West, um, the Western world and the Eastern world and Asia and that kind of stuff, um, which, you know, a lot of you people probably traveled and uh, probably know about. Um, so it isn't, you know, too far out um, of this world to consider that there's, you know, actual differences between Indigenous and, you know, the colonial powers um, at bay, which are quite a lot, you know, for Indigenous people who are more generally speaking, um, more community focus, where again, generally speaking in Western countries, it's more, you know, individual um, and even in Eastern countries, I think there's a big focus on, on family and family well-being. We're a bit, uh, you know, self-centered in Western nations, uh, if I can be quite frank. Um, so there are differences, there's a lot of research around it, specifically, you know, cultural um, academic research and that kind of stuff which I've looked at and also done quantitative um, and qualitative uh, research of my own. And basically, you know, broke down those cultural differences and how that, would, um, how that would show up in the business operations. Um, so yeah, we've done a fair bit of work and uh, differentiating uh, indigenous versus Western entrepreneurship based on cultural differences. And this is from Miles Richard, who was um, the president of the council, excuse me, of Haida Nation in uh, Canada. And he said, you know, you've still got to build entrepreneurs, your community, corporations and your nation's initiative in a way that reflects who we are. So again, you know, it's not making this stuff up. There are differences and Indigenous people, you know, around the world um, feel that and respect it. And at the moment, I don't think that's being incorporated in Australia. You know, it's still very, um, you know, forcing, I guess, Indigenous people to act a certain way um, instead of focusing on supporting, you know, their uh, self-determination rights as per the United Nations and and general human um, basic you know, needs and rights. So the problem with Western management, in my opinion, um, well, it's not my opinion, my bad. Um, you know, closing gap targets have been going for, you know, donkey edges now, at least over 10 years, and they haven't really um, made a difference per se with most of the targets to close the disparity gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So the system is obviously flawed, and, you know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, which, you know, it's... Uh, can be a common thing with governments, um, not just Indigenous affairs. Um, obviously, yeah, uh, important part to that is the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which does, you know, promote um, you know, self-governance of Indigenous people. Um, and yeah, I've also read different polls and you know, speaking to a lot of people about what they think are the problems with Western management and control of Indigenous funding specifically. Um, and you had uh, from unrealistic expectations. I thought like racial discrimination would be up there, but unrealistic expectations was the top one and then discrimination and then unsafe cultural practices and then micromanagement. Um, was the last one around 20%. But the first one, unrealistic expectations, um, I guess, you know, with Indigenous affairs, they might employ Indigenous people, but it's still government controlled and run, um, despite the claims of Indigenous ownership. Uh, and, 
yeah, they just don't have, I guess, the best insight of Indigenous Aboriginal communities, how to support them. Um, and that shows when they, uh, you know, reach out to the respective community to help them. And, um, you know, the community might be saying, we need this, and then the government will do something else or, or again, have those unrealistic expectations. I know I felt that um, when I had a government grant and uh, they'll basically tell me like there's, you know, millions of, not millions, but massive exaggeration, like there's tons of Indigenous entrepreneurs running around. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's growing. The industry is growing, Indigenous entrepreneurship is growing, but there's not that many people. So I recommend it you know, with a small batch of numbers to focus on Indigenous entrepreneurs to support, but they basically wouldn't give me the contract unless I said, you know, extended the numbers, basically double, tripled the numbers of Indigenous entrepreneurs I'd support over the lifetime of that government contract. So, you know, unrealistic, unrealistic expectations is a big one because, it, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on Indigenous people who know, you know what they're doing, know the market, know the community, um, but then, you know, <clears throat> getting told to do something else um, by the government. So that's why I started the lottery too, trying to stay away, you know, from government funding. Although, you know, government funding, if you want to make a lot of money that's in the Indigenous space, that's where you would normally go for sure. But then you look at the Indigenous funding and, um, and then you dig a bit deeper and actually the money is going to mostly, you know, non-Indigenous organisations and, and back into the government coffers, into their own departments. For example, New South Wales Government ex, uh, Indigenous Expenditure Report, um, you know, they had a, a billion dollars, around about a billion dollars that they were supposedly investing uh, into Indigenous people to help Indigenous people, which worked out to be around about 3,700 for the you know, population of New South, Indigenous population of New South Wales, around 230,000 people. Um, but most of that, yeah, billion dollars, 676.7 million went back into the government coffers and, and uh, yeah, who knows you know, where that money went after that. Um, so, and um, despite, yeah, the UN's Indigenous Declaration of Indigenous People, um, you know, even the UN, United Nations don't get it right. They put together a massive fund, like, you know, billions of dollars and what the findings show that only 7% of funding went directly to Indigenous and community organisations, despite, you know, the protection they provide to forests and other ecosystems and, you know, how the United Nations always talks up Indigenous people, how they're you know, one of the largest conservatives around the world, but when it comes to giving them funding, you know, kind of like the Australian government, all the money goes to these, uh, what I call the middlemen, um, they like to position themselves, you know, where the money is in between the money and the Indigenous communities. And, um, you know, once the money that makes it into the uh, Aboriginal communities is very little from where it started off. Um, and also another problem with Western management is, yeah, extreme capitalism from, uh, you know, a few wealthy people who have been able to use their money to lobby the government to the extreme, um, where they pay little to no tax and um, start their own charities and that kind of stuff. Um, we had, yeah, the top 10 uh, billionaires, uh, wealthiest people around in the world had more wealth than the bottom 40, 50%, which is crazy. Okay, so another problem with um, Western management is what I call blackwashing, which is like greenwashing. It's a pretty simple um, turn, but yeah. So I did this quick little poll on LinkedIn just to see what people thought and, and blackwashing. So black, B-L-A-K instead of B-L-A-C-K, which is a color, I guess black um, definition is more um, for indigenous people to relate you know, to their ancestors. Um, but yeah, so the blackwashing was the most popular um, at the time. But yeah, it's just like greenwashing. So, you know, organisations pretending they're green and, you know, helping the environment. And they, you know, spend a lot of money through media to promote that. But, you know, behind the scenes, they're just <laughs> destroying the water, destroying the land, um, just to make a profit. So it's kind of like that where um, Indigenous 
um, like Indigenous procurement policy, supposedly they're spending billions now. But you have these organisations uh, that pretend to be, you know, green, or they pretend to be, uh, quote unquote, Indigenous owned, and blackwash it, uh, to, you know, to make a lot of money, and uh, which is good for them. Uh, and, but you know, the money doesn't. The trickle down economy effect doesn't really work, and Aboriginal communities are still, you know, living in poverty and. Um, and the closing up targets are hardly closing. So that's a problem I have with that, not the fact that people are getting rich out of government contracts, just the fact that a social procurement policy isn't reaching the people um, that it was meant to support. Um, another problem with Western management is, you know, sometimes you get, uh, you know, uh, people that uh, very against Indigenous people, like the minister down there, Liberal minister, he reckons, you know, we won this land fair and square. Um, I guess kind of like how Russia won the land of Ukraine fair and square. Um, so you have these people that pop up and, you know, you call them whatever you're right, right extremists, but there's left extremists too. They come in all different forms, but they're very anti-Indigenous people, you know, trolling, continuously trolling on social media. Um, about the different topics, uh, anti-Indigenous you know, rights and, and people. So, um, you know, the, to have the United Nations um, declaration around self-governance, um, empowering yeah, Indigenous communities and decolonizing economic justice, you know, cutting with all these middlemen that take all the money that's supposed to be Indigenous people, um, is what I see um, as decolonization and the move forward because if we keep on yeah the same thing um, it's just not going to have result in the community and help to uh, close the disparity gaps so yeah that's that's all I had Sophie um, I try to run through that as quickly as possible so but perfect. perfect thank you so thank much, you so much thank you <laughs> We unfortunately don't have time for questions, but I just want to thank you so much, Dean, for your time. That was an extremely comprehensive overview of the situation here in Australia, so-called Australia, and um, definitely so many points there that we'll be unpacking further with Dr. Catherine Trebek and Dr. Sabrina Chikori. Um, but certainly we cannot have economic justice without First Nations economic justice. So I, I really want to thank you for framing this conversation with us tonight. Um, and yeah, we look forward to packing, unpacking this further in our following talks and on the panel. Okay, so next up, I would like to invite Dr. Catherine Trebek to come up and do her talk. So Dr. Catherine Trebek is the co-founder of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, or We All. And if you don't know that organization, please look it up. Catherine is an advocate for economic change with roles including writer in residence at the University of Edinburgh and a strategic advisor for the Centre for Policy Development. She co-founded the Wellbeing Economy Alliance in We All Scotland and instigated the Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership. She sits on advisory groups including the Democracy Collaborative, the C40 Think Tank and the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity. Her most recent book with Jeremy Williams in 2019 is The Economics of Arrival, and her major report being Bold, Budgeting for Children's Wellbeing was launched in March 2021. Catherine, I'd love to invite you up, please, and a round of applause to welcome her. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I think you should all have a massive pat on the back because you're the people who have showed up after lunch on a Monday to talk about economics. <laughs> so good on you. But I don't think you're sort of misled in your decision to turn up and have this discussion because the question of social justice is the other side of the coin from the question of environmental breakdown. The two things are linked by the economic system. And we've talked this morning about the deep roots of the way the economic... That's listing, isn't it? Is that better? Can I pull that down? No. OK, you're just going to have to put up with it. Or at least I can hear an echo. I hope that's not annoying you too much. Yeah, so we've talked this morning about the deep roots of our economic system, why it is purposed and designed. And when you look upstream to the economy and you see it's colonisation, it's patriarchy, it's deep-seated racism. But I want you to just hold that space 
of our economic system, our production and consumption systems, how we produce things for each other, how we distribute those resources, essentially how we try to provide people have a good life. And so often what we're told of how we get a good life is through more and more consumption. Work hard, earn shed loads of money, spend it. That's the recipe so often that we're told. Some people even go so far as to say the route to a good life, the route to happiness, is to just buy a bottle of Coke and take it home and things will be fantastic. Self-help gurus tell us that the route to happiness is within us. And all we have to do is change our thinking, change our mindsets, maybe do some mindfulness, be more resilient, despite no matter how adverse the circumstances facing us are. And then happiness magazines, and this is one that I sneakily took a photo of the table of contents in my local news agent back in Glasgow where I used to live, they would tell us that the route to happiness is take your dog for a walk, have your friends round for wine in the evenings, do some yoga, and go on a meditation retreat to Thailand. All very well, except if you are one in six people in Australia who are below the poverty line, you're not going to be able to afford to go to a yoga retreat in Thailand. If your landlord has just jacked up your rent, taking your dog for the, a walk is going to be the last thing on your mind. If you're being evacuated from your home because of floods, doing a bit of meditation is going to be a bit of an inconvenience. And so what we need to do is ask ourselves bigger questions about how we ensure that everyone has a quality of life. And the problem is that the recipes we've grasped for, we've reached for as society so far, have patiently failed to deliver what I think is the ultimate 21st century challenge. And this, I promise you this is the only chart I'm going to show because you've got an academic following me who's going to give you all the granularity. I'm going to stay big picture, I promise. Go back to the cartoons in a minute. But this research here has been conducted by ecological economists at the University of Leeds. And what they did is they looked around the world for an economic system at the country level, so ignoring in-country inequality, so hold that because that's fundamental. But they looked around the world and they said, can we find an economy that delivers on average for its citizens without putting undue pressure on the planet? Seems like a pretty natural question, pretty important question to ask of our economic systems. And what they found is that no country nails it. If we saw them, you'd see them in the top right-hand corner there. But what we see is GDP-rich countries like Australia, on average, so this is parking all the internal inequalities, on average deliver okay for citizens, but they put huge pressure on their biosphere. And then other countries down here tread lightly on the planet, but they don't lift their citizens above a social foundation. And so we're collectively failing to deliver for people within respect of the planet. And so what we're offered in response to that failure of that 21st century question is more economic growth. And we had Ronald Reagan telling us that there is no limits to growth because there is no limits to human ingenuity and wonder. It's assumed that we just have more economic growth, that'll be an automatic read across to reduce poverty, reduce inequality, and it'll be fine for the environment because we'll be able to pay for all the fancy technologies to undo the damage that we're putting on the planet. So that's one of the responses that we get. But of course, all that damage to the planet costs money to spend on. And so often we see the terrain of so much social policy and charitable effort is spent dealing with the collateral damage of our economic system. And this is what social scientists are increasingly starting to call failure demand. And if you start to look at the news headlines of recent government announcements, you'll see that so much of what government does is response to our collective failure to get things right for people from the beginning. So it's top-up wages, it's subsidies, it's food banks, it's mental health treatments, it's security guards because we're spent, scared of each other. It's a lot of the criminal justice system because we're, we're not able to take care of each other. 
And in environmental terms, they talk about ecologic, ecological economists would talk about defensive expenditure. And I was trying to figure out a way to describe this idea of failure demand, just this absurdity that we're spending a shed load of money to heal what we break. And I was walking down the street in Glasgow, and I saw these two signs together. Now, no offense to anyone who's into CrossFit, <laughs> but essentially, collectively, we are spending a lot of money because of damage that we deliberately did to each other in pursuit of growth and damage to the planet. And just think of how much money we're going to have to spend cleaning up after these floods spreading across New South, New South Wales and Victoria. So even on its own terms, those recipes of grow the economy big and then use that money to inadequately try to respond to that downstream collateral damage is failing. And then the other response we get is this profound individualization of bigger structural problems. The onus of change is put on the individual to toughen up, to be more resilient, to be more employable, to change your thinking, and not enough attention is looking at the decisions that are taking beyond the individual control. So what can we have instead? And this is where this agenda is building to think about can we ask more of our economies? Can we ask the economy to deliver social justice on a healthy planet? Can we look upstream and attend to those root causes of that collateral damage? Can we dare to imagine an economy that delivers for people and planet? So that's what the wellbeing economy is all about, asking the economy to focus deliberately, not on incremental GDP growth every quarter, not on profits, not on the stock market, not on the consumer price index, not on house prices, but on delivering collective human and ecological wellbeing. And that's nice to say, but it's a profound mindset shift. How many of you recognize this image, this sort of 1990s sustainable development goal image? And this idea that you have that sustainable development is about focusing on the environment, society, and the economy. I think this is one of the most dangerous images out there because what it implies is that our economy is an objective in its own right, on parallel with society and nature. And inherent to the wellbeing economy agenda is flipping that on its head and listening to what ecological economists and what feminist economists have been telling us for decades and what First Nations communities have been living for millennia, that we need to understand the economy as nested within society and the two as nested within our ecosystems and design the economy to be explicitly in service of those higher order goals. So that's easy for me to say to an audience like this, but it is a fundamental mindset shift. Imagine if our treasurer, if our finance ministers, if our bureaucrats went to work every day thinking, how can we design the economy so that it's in service of social justice on a healthy planet, rather than thinking we'll just grow the economy big and that'd be an automatic read across to solving all our other problems. So there's a ton of changes that we're going to have to grapple with to bring about that economic transformation from the local right up to the supranational, like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. But if any of you were doing jigsaw puzzles during lockdown period, as so many people were, you'll know that every good jigsaw puzzle person starts with the corners. So I get my head around all the changes that we need to bring about that sort of economic transformation by thinking about the four corners of this wellbeing economy jigsaw puzzle. And conveniently, they all start with a P. So the four P's of the wellbeing economy. The first one is about purpose. Doing what Dale was about describing there, really thinking what's the purpose of business? What's the purpose of our macro economy? Being fair weather friends of growth thinking beyond GDP, things like outcomes budgeting, multi-dimensional well-being frameworks, pro-social business models, as you've just heard about. The next one is prevention. This is about not being content just to spend money servicing that failure, putting sticking plasters or band-aids, I can say now I'm back in Australia, putting band-aids on the damage that our economic systems, our extractive economic systems have wrought on our communities and on our planet. So looking upstream and paying attention there to the root causes. The third P is a bit of a clunky term, but to me it's the most exciting concept. It's about pre-distribution. It's about saying, can we do more than let the gap between rich and poor open up and then turning to government at five o'clock in the afternoon and saying, let's just, through tax and welfare, slightly reduce that gap with all the political machinations that that entails, 
all the tax evasion and avoidance that you've read about in the recent years in the Panama Papers, in the Paradise Papers, but saying, can we get the economy to do more of the heavy lifting? Can we design market outcomes so they deliver more equal distribution of resources from the beginning? So here we're talking about things like social enterprises, worker cooperatives, community enterprises, community wealth building, so we build the economy from the grassroots up rather than crossing our fingers and hoping for the wealth to trickle down. True cost accounting as well, so we have a fair picture of the social and environmental impact of the sort of economic activities that we're selecting between. And then the final P is people powered, really making sure that people are at the forefront of this change, that they feel in control of the economic system, that they are at the heart of how we do produce and consume and distribute resources. So things like participatory budgeting, economic democracy, citizens' assemblies. So I've got to leave you with four tips on how to go forward on your journey as change agents, because you are all part of this movement to build about a wellbeing economy. So my four tips are, if any of you hang out with a three-year-old, a niece, a nephew, a son or a daughter, a grandchild, you know they go through that stage where they ask, but why? So channel your inner three-year-old and ask, but why, but why, but why? Don't be content just to look at the symptoms and the fallout of our current economic system. Channel your inner three-year-old and look upstream to the root causes. Second one is be fair weather friends of growth rather than its ever faithful followers. This is about understanding that difference between means and ends, thinking about the economy not in a goal in its own right, but something we need to design purposefully to deliver higher order goals of social justice on a healthy planet. This means paying attention to the distribution, the composition of growth, rather than being obsessed with its quarterly rate, as we hear about in our news stories. The third one is support the pioneers, because the good news is that there are initiatives and businesses and practices around the world where people are rolling up their sleeves and building this sort of economic system in communities, in cities, in regions, even at the supranational level, there are people working to create this. But at the moment, like little rocks in a stream, the water as business as usual just carries on around them. So we need to elevate them, we need to connect them, support them together so we, together we can turn the tide. And we also need to tell other people about those amazing examples. So each time you choose to shop at a nice local worker cooperative, or you take your iPhone to be repaired rather than throwing it out. All those sorts of activities are people who are undertaking economic activity but with a purpose of supporting the environment or supporting social justice goals. Tell other people about that because then we start to create replication, we start to create new norms and we can build towards a tipping point. But also tell the politicians about those amazing activities because they prove that building a different economic system is not just desirable, but it's absolutely possible. And what we need is our politicians to get on the right side of history and change the rules of the game so that those pioneers are no longer the exception that proves the rule, but they make up the majority of our economic ecosystems. And then finally, just stay active, keep going on this. And I want to leave you with this beautiful quote from Schumacher who said, can we rely on enough people turning it around in enough time to save the modern world. Now, he was writing in the 70s, but now when we're talking about head, headlong to a code red for humanity, he could be writing now. And Schumacher says that if we answer yes to that, that will lead to complacency. And then he said, if we answer no, that will lead to despair. So if we feel helpless, we will give up. And he said, the only way to attend to this is to leave those perplexities behind us and just get down to work. So in that spirit, thank you for all you do, and let's transform the economy together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was really inspirational, and I love how you've set the tone for an economy that, whose purpose is to achieve social and, econ and environmental justice and to really be that bridge between the two. So thank you very much for setting the scene. We're now going to have Dr. Sabrina Chikori speak specifically to degrowth. So Dr. Sabrina, Dr. Sabrina Chikori is a founder of the Brisbane Tool Library and the co-founder of the Degrowth Journal. Um, but she is also currently working at CSIRO. And her current research focuses on the complex social, economic, and ecological interaction that can influence a socially just and ecologically sustainable transition in Australia. 
So she's really at the front lines here. Sabrina is also the course coordinator at the University of Queensland, and she's teaching e-technology applications in food systems. Um, and she's also done her PhD in exploring packaged food reduction in food systems. And her work provided a repositioning of the socio-materiality of food packaging, politicizing packaged food, and highlighting the need to pursue degrowth strategies to increase the sustainability of food systems. She has also been advocating for a more sustainable society and leading numerous collaborations in various countries across Europe, Kenya, Ecuador, Mexico, and Australia, including an initiative with Queensland's Environment Minister to introduce the law banning single-use plastics. To translate into practice her knowledge and vision in 2017 was when she founded the Brisbane Tool Library, which is a social enterprise that encourages people to borrow tools camping gear and other equipment. And this community-driven circular economy model reduces productivism and consumerism. And the Brisbane Tool Library is Australia's first and only library of things to be located within a public library, which is the State Library of Queensland. And as I said as well, Sabrina co-founded the Degrowth Journal, which is an academic journal supporting the science and the decommodification of knowledge. She's a Post-Growth Institute Fellow, winner of the 2020 Create Change Seven News Young Achiever Award and recipient of the Emerging Female Leader Bursary from the National Council of Women of Queensland. She's a multi-award winning social entrepreneur, researcher and educator invested in systemic change. We're definitely in good company here. Sabrina, I'd like to invite you to come up on stage. <laughs> from a comment that someone mentioned before lunch in the session saying that in order to change the story, we need to understand the story, right? So hopefully uh, the presentation today will give you some um, tools that you can use to dismantle the system to then rebuild it into something that fits for you and your community. That's me, I was much more pinkish. Um, I was born in 92, which was the first climate summit in Rio de Janeiro. Why I say that is we always think about environmental degradation and we always have this narrative that we have to do it for future generations. But I have inherited this sick planet. I am that future generation. So that narrative of postponing the, the problems is just a way to keep business as usual going. So I was born into this crisis. And as Erfan said this morning, I'd rather be doing something else than talking about capitalism after lunch. So because I know that we are a bit in an echo chamber, and if you're here today, you're very aware of the social and ecological crisis, I won't go through any of the uh, data that shows you know, the level of environmental degradation, greenhouse gases accumulation, inequality impacts. Any study you look at, from planet's boundaries analysis to ecological footprint, they all converge towards a very catastrophic situation. A little bit about myself. I started very young doing, being active, I guess. And, you know, I fought against deforestation, against plastic production and, you know, uh, waste management, etc. And I arrived in my 20s where I couldn't choose anymore which fight to battle for, right? Um, gender violence, refugees um, situation were equally important than ocean degradation and deforestation. So I had to step back and try to think about what was the root cause linking all these problems. I didn't want to prioritize one area rather than the other. I wanted to tackle the root, that upstream problem that Catherine was mentioning in order to have a broader impact on all the social and ecological issues. And here we get into the academic part. And again, I don't expect you to read all of this, but uh, if you do want these references or slides afterward, I'm happy to share them. So we, there's a global agreement that we live in the Anthropocene, which is the era where human-induced activities are leading to these environmental damages. All good, these, all these quotes have been taken from the IPCC, the UN uh, climate reports, and 
again, the, the word Anthropocene comes over and over. And finally, because that wasn't uh, given for granted, we agree that human-induced um, activities have an impact. But I want you to push you even further. Some scholars would talk about the capitalocene. Because the word Anthropocene means that humans across the planet have the same impact that an Australian citizen has the same impact as an indigenous in the Amazon forest. It assumes that we are not organized in specific socioeconomic forms, but we are. And so the capital scene points out that we live in the era of capital, and capital for capital accumulation is leading to the exploitation of labor and um, the environment. And I will push you even further. Some somebody of literature would talk about the necrocene and is the age of death and extinction as a result of capitalist accumulation. The necrocene points out that capitalism is a mechanism of self-destruction. By reproducing productivity, is destroying everything else on its way. So is the reciprocal transmutation of life into death and death into capital. And I do want you to remember one of these words because when we come into the conversation and we talk about the capital scene, we are shifting the conversation, pointing out at the system in place. And I will stick with the capital scene as a term. In the capital scene, we still measure economic prosperity in terms of GDP. Especially now, post-pandemic, post-COVID pandemic, we hear that our we are in a crisis, GDP is not growing enough, and unfortunately, we don't understand always what GDP, the gross domestic product, means. GDP is just an index that has been um, introduced after the Second World War, so a pretty recent index. And it measures all the um, economic transactions in terms of monetary terms of services and good exchange in the economy. It doesn't measure all the voluntary work, caring work, and so on. So just to give you an example, if you have a child and you send it to childcare, you're increasing the GDP. If you decide to look after your children or your elders at home, you're not increasing the GDP. If you're cycling to your farmer market, you're not increasing the GDP. If you're driving your car, you are increasing GDP. So you can see that GDP doesn't really translate into ecological or social prosperity. A standing forest doesn't increase GDP. If we cut it and turn it into furniture, it does increase GDP. And I will tell you more. We hear that we are in a crisis and GDP is not growing enough. If you do want to grow your economy, accidents grow GDP. So you can go out today and contribute to the economy. Obesity, health issues, they're all activities that they do increase GDP and economic growth. So if you really want to follow that agenda, those are the kind of activities. P cleaning up after pollution and polluting in first place does increase GDP. So when we understand how uh, the economy is measured and organized, we can start opening up a different conversation. The other problem with economic growth is that no matter how many resources we consume, we never seem to have enough. Capitalism is based on structures of scarcity. There is not enough to it. It's always capital uh, looking to expand into more capital. And we have to keep in mind that even if this tell us this idea of an infinite economic growth, human need might be actually finite. Is a, we, we live in a socially constructed society where we led to think that our needs are infinite. For example, plastic is a material that is actually very durable. And Hawking says, how did a material as tough and durable as plastic became classified as transient and disposable? The paradox of how plastic material endurance and synthetic immortality have, become, have been obliterated by economic and cultural practices. Another example on how this economic growth is fueled is planned obsolescence. Industrial designers are led to design items to break down so that you can or you have to replace them more often and therefore they can increase sales, revenues, profit, capital investments. In, in all that process, there's labor exploitation and environmental degradation. Um, I really recommend this book, A History of the Word in Seven Cheap Things. And he 
um, explains how our economy is based on exploitation. Exploitation we heard a lot about, you know, social inequalities this morning. But um, here I want to raise your attention that some groups in society, women, people of color, uh, indigenous people around the world have been excluded from humanity so that capitalism could be fueled. Um, and we have to think about commodity frontiers. What is that? There are those geographical areas where nature is still uncommodified, right? And because our economy needs to expand continuously, capitalism keep going into uncommodified areas and land to exploit people and, and environments. Uh, sorry, environments, people, culture. So that can translate into mining, you know, indigenous people that see the land becoming a mine, and then they're given a job, but at least they have a job, you know, this idea of creating decent jobs in exploited areas. We are living in a climate apartheid. And I don't use the word, I didn't use it first, <laughs> the literature did, but I don't use the word um, uh, lightly. We are in an apartheid, and it has been studied as a process of violence against people and that perpetuates this uh, dominant system between global north and global south, between country and urban areas, and in other ways within countries. We live in a climate apartheid in two senses. And one is that the people producing most of the environmental degradation are not the one receiving it, right? And the other people on the other side, they are not left with margin of development, but they are paying the cost of it. So, what else? <laughs> How do we get out of this mess? Luckily, there, is, there are actually um, many body of literature that point out that potential solution, but they remain still um, taboo into mainstream arenas. And one is economic degrowth, or for the most politically correct, is called also post-growth. So degrowth is a voluntary and equitable downscaling of the economy toward a sustainable, just, and participatory steady-state society. A planned contraction of the energy and resource demands of the overgrown economies for social justice, ecological viability, and for human flourishing beyond consumerism and productivism. So this second part is of Samuel Alexander, which is a great deep rose scholar based here in Melbourne. So first of all, all I'm talking about here is about global north countries, because we have to clean up our mess, and it's not up to me for sure, or us, to say what they can or not um, global south countries, okay? The main idea of DeGro is how do we build a thriving society within planet boundaries? And that is not subjective. We have a limited capacity, we have planet boundaries but, that we can't change, but we can change the economy that fits into it. Again, there's more and more literature coming out in, uh, in the degrowth space, in academic journals, as well as books. And I had to pick a few um, pathways to suggest today. So the first one is I would like you to go out from today's session repoliticizing sustainability. Sustainability used to be a term that used to be antagonist to business as usual, to the capitalist system. But it has been co-opted into green growth or green capitalism or that greenwashing and blackwashing that we just heard before, right? So we need to stand on our feet and point out what is sustainable and what isn't. And I put there the SDGs because the infiltration and co-option of the economic uh, growth system is everywhere. Alongside some great goals, the SDG have number eight is an economic growth goal. Again, as Catherine said, we have to understand the end goals, the means, the processes. And I never use the SDGs because the number eight would basically offset everything else. Again, responsible consumption and production number 12, it doesn't say that we need to reduce in absolute term both these activities. Second, second, we need to measure what matters, which means social and ecological prosperity. We need to change our system of national accounts, and we can discuss that later in the panel because Dr. Katrin Tebeck is actually an expert in there. But there are different indices, these different frameworks that could be adopted to prioritize social and ecological well-being rather than profit and growth. 
we have to clarify what the relative decoupling and absolute decoupling is. So in that core option of what sustainability is, we techno-optimists, they're saying to us that we can continue business as usual, we just have to invest in cleaner technologies, in most efficient technologies, right? And that's what is called relative decoupling. It means that we just need to produce more efficiently the same products, right? But hear me here. Capitalism has never been against producing more efficiently something. Actually, with less resources and less inputs, they can increase the profit and expand production. So the, re the risk with relative decoupling is that even if we produce more efficiently with better technologies, if the goal remains infinite growth, the environmental gains will be offset by increased production. In fact, all data shows that relative decoupling is not happening. So we have to shift that conversation uh, towards absolute decoupling. What can we actually reduce in absolute term? And yes, so degrowth pushes us to think about voluntary frugality and simplicity, need-oriented production, need-based consumption, and that comes obviously with a change in value. It pushes us to think about services more than products, and if products are ne necessary, then let's design them uh, so that they last. Degrowth also pushes us to rethink work. What do we need to work for? What do we need to produce? What do we need to consume? And probably this is a newest form of class war. And some authors are asking the unions, they're asking worker movements, not only to fight for their, their you know, uh, pay raise, not only to fight to work three days rather than five, but to actually have a more um, ecological class fighting together to fit the economy into the social boundaries. This could look in different ways in different countries. It could be mean um, introducing a basic income or sharing working mechanisms or just prioritizing social well-being than productivity. Um, we have a problem here, is that all these great um, perspectives we hear today, when we bring them in the outside world, we are faced with a big wall, which is First of all, the degradation of democracy around the world because of the asymmetric power that big corporations and lobbies have. This text comes from the IPCC, the UN, and as you can see, it says, political economy should feature prominently in transitions. Some branches of political economy research underline how resource-intensive and fossil fuel industry leverage their resources and position to undermine transition. So this is not an easy battle. And even the UN acknowledges that we have you know, uh, some lobbies that they want to keep st the status quo. We, faced with this, we are seeing a lot of movement out there, including scientists that you know, they realize that publishing great research is not enough. And this leads us to rethink democracy. Do we still live in a democratic system? And if not, what else can we do? There are big questions in here that we need to discuss. Do we need a degrowth agenda into the mainstream political system? Do we need a party to pick some degrowth initiative? Or do we need to reframe completely what democracy it is, or nation states, or what we want out of our democratic system? And these are big questions, you know? And, but we need to start having these conversations. Finally, well, not really, but I will try to finish soon. <laughs> So we have this um, macro, meso, and micro level. We get told to ride our bicycle, make our shampoo, make our bread, look after our children, smile, and do meditation. That's not working. On the other side, I'm telling you that we have to shift away from capitalism. That probably won't happen today either. But an unexplored land is that meso level, is how can we recreate the commons and do this together? In, in responding to this question I created in 2017, the Brisbane Tool Library. Radical change can happen in various ways. And as we can see here, I have the tendency to think in systems, and I think that we need to broaden that conversation towards the systematic change. And be aware that around you there are shadow networks. Shadow networks are defined like networks that operate outside the dominant system and function as incubator of new practices. Which means that if you are starting your own organization or joining one, it doesn't really matter if you're failing, but as long as you push the boundaries towards something new. 
The commons are not just, you know, how we um, share resources. The common is about having a plan as a community, deciding, in installing new democratic processes. Um, the commons itself, it's a re-evaluation of human relationship and is the process of commoning that is actually important. And just on that uh, absolute decoupling, people at the tool library, they can borrow tools, they can borrow other things. And wonder what? We are reducing absolute consumption, but we are not reducing the experience that people have because we are providing uh, the same use rights. So that's the way of shifting the conversation or the structure that we need. Finally, there's this paper and many other that they show many other practical policies that you could um, read, understand, incorporate into your own practices or push your political system uh, to adopt. So I'm not going through that. Finally, the key messages I want to leave you with is please reclaim back the sustainability agenda, resist and refuse the growth-driven system. Keep alive the idea of a non-capitalism society because capitalism has not been here forever. Second, acknowledge that you can't do it alone. You can't do it with your own companies. You can't do it with your own startup or social enterprise. We have to, like it or not, collaborate on this. We need innovation in social and political structures. And if you are part of a local movement, then you have also to fit a global agenda. And this is really my last slide. Another word is possible. And this is really the imaginary counterpower that we have to keep alive. Because not only the current system is exploiting labor and the environment, but they're also making us think that we can't invent a, a different world, that we can't shift. So as long as you're going to keep this one only message in mind, then we can probably do it. Thank you. Wow, incredible. Thank you so much, Sabrina. That was extremely <laughs> comprehensive as well. Should we get onto the panel and um, unpack a few things? We don't have heaps of time. Um, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pop them in Hoover. Um, I'll keep checking my phone as we go through and get into it. Okay. <laughs> So a, a big theme for me that's in my head is this issue of redistribution. So, Catherine, you look like you're burning to answer something. <laughs> I'm just raring to go. So the issue, obviously, is that we've got the economy is growing, but the money just isn't reaching the right people. How? What are the mechanisms, or what what ways are there that we can redistribute this wealth to the right people? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So I'd say we can do better than redistribute. Okay. We should yeah. pre-distribute. Um, third P. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're right. So at the moment, the gains to growth are going to those at the very top. And that was exacerbated, and particularly in wealth terms, exacerbated during COVID. In Australia that likes to think of itself as an egalitarian country, in terms of wealth, the Productivity Commission says that the top 10% have 40 times as much wealth as the bottom 10%. Globally, there are about 2,781, I think, billionaires who, and there's a huge correlation between that financial wealth and environmental in, impact. Uh, these, these are the people, wherever they're located around the world, whose their consumption patterns, the way they travel, the way they eat, their houses, all their consumption patterns are the ones that are putting undue pressure on the planet. They're literally eating up more than their fair share of ecological room. And so, one, we need to attend to that level of extreme wealth, and we haven't even talked about the extent of political capture inherent in that. Uh, Dean hinted at it a little bit. And so the, the way to do that is, yes, in the short term, through maybe some, and this is sort of 20th century social democracy, sort of redistribute through tax and welfare systems, but I think we need to do better than that because those, that recipe relies on the growing economy. Essentially, grow the economy big, turn a blind eye to the collateral damage, extract some back through tax and welfare, and then spend it through redistribution on welfare, on payments, and so on. 
And if we take the science of planetary boundaries seriously, we know that we cannot keep growing the economy. So we need, you know, it's basically as simple as saying, you can't keep growing the pie because the oven is only so big. We need to find ways to share the pie much better, more, much more equitably. And so that's where I think it comes down to those, I, those systems of how we produce and consume, the way we structure our businesses, who owns capital, the wages people get, how we price goods and services so we know the, the true cost of, of different prices. Uh, things like the community wealth building agenda is a really exciting one. It's basically using local planning and procurement and local ownership to get the economy growing from the community and grassroots up rather than sort of relying on Amazon and fingers crossed things will, things will trickle down. Uh, so there's lots and lots of different pieces in that corner of the, the pre-distribution jigsaw puzzle. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually interesting because we have this tendency, and I, I had it as well, you know, on how do we redistribute money. But the question is, what do we need money for? You know, just to give you an example in practical terms, and maybe people here are running social enterprises, we always think, oh, we need fundings, right, for social enterprises. And then often those funding goes into rent or other things. So in building the Brisbane Tool Library, I thought, what if I just ask directly what I need rather than going through the money part, right? So I needed a space rather than fundraising to pay rent for a space, I asked for a space. And I think, you know, Aboriginal culture has a lot to teach us in that sense, and I'm not <laughs> the right person to ask, you know. Can we shift around the conversation around money? I'm not saying this is really like, you know, future, <laughs> future thinking, but, um, you know, private property, can we question that? Because we are seeing that even if we redistribute today, you know, money in a more equitable ways in Australia, if you don't control the housing market, the, you know, skyrocketing rents, that money is going to just flow again into the pocket of the same people. So it's like, what do we need money for? And are there other ways than just redistributing money that we can provide those services and access to the needs of people? Awesome. Thank you. That's definitely interesting to think about in that sense. The other thing I wanted to ask was, how, how do we change this economic system? It seems like such a big task, and I mean, Sabrina, you touched on it as well with, in terms of the individual and also the structural kind of levels. Can we delve on that a little bit deeper in terms of what you're actually doing? Catherine, I'd love to hear more about what you're doing with WeGo, for example, with governments, and Sabrina, a bit more about the Brisbane Tool Library and some of your research as well. Do you want to start now? Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, so I realised that one thing that is very useful is to name things as they are, right? When we come into stage, into a meeting, somewhere say, oh, the system is creating, it's not a system, is the capitalist system. So once we you know, name the things clearly, that's already open up to a different agenda. Um, yes, with the tool library, what we realized it was these things of recreating the commons, right? Which is a very weird idea because we hate each other, we can't even date each other anymore, we need a phone to do it. <laughs> and then suddenly someone is saying, let's change the word together, right? So we. We neoliberalized every action, you know, we individualized every action of our life, and then we are asked to do this together. But I think there's a um, not cut short in there. You, you, we have to do it. And I had, you know, and that, with that, you have, we have, you know, to let go of our ego or, or our high expectation, you know, especially when you are an entrepreneur and you want to, you know, they push you to grow up and scale up and colonize the world, etc. Well, it doesn't work like this. So we've been up for six years now and it's organic and we are, have had like 50 volunteers active. No one is paid at the two library, which, you know, has limitations. But yeah, we had to rebuild what is connection, what is true democratic um, management, what is anarchism, which is often used as a, you know, uh, a, a term that is negative and almost to point out a disorganized movement. But actually, anarchism is much more <laughs> organized than we, one could think. So along this journey, I've been just exploring more and more radical thinking and radical action, and then try to implement it. So if we've done that in Brisbane with uh, ECO across Australia, I guess everyone you know, can do it. So we all, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, it's a global collaboration of all sorts of different organisations. It's essentially a, a multi-stakeholder group of people who have come together in all their different ways, with all their different contributions, all their different spheres of influence, but who are united by the sense 
that if we're going to have a fighting chance at dealing with the challenges facing the world today, we've got to deal with the way the economic system is structured, but they also want to collaborate with others to bring about that change. So there's well over, I think, 280 organisations now, from businesses to policymakers to networks to academics to activists, and they have monthly talks, they have monthly members meetings to support each other. There's local hubs bubbling up, so there's about 17 local hubs from Scotland to South Africa. There's WeGo, which you mentioned, Sophie. So WeGo is something we all instigated, and it's a group of governments, so it's called the Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership. It's Scotland, New Zealand, Iceland, Wales, Finland, and Canada. And these are all governments who recognise, I guess, the sort of questions we're talking about here, that in the 21st century, we can't measure success and national development through, purely through the prism of GDP, who want to learn from each other to put well-being into economic policy making, who want to go on that journey of continuous improvement. They're less explicit about this, but I think it's important that they are new heroes, new champions that show it's possible because if you look at global geopolitics, so many of the clubs, the entry ticket to clubs, the G7, the G20, the BRICS, the voting power, you know, the UN, the World Bank, the IMF, is all how big is your GDP? And so you take off that lens and you put on the lens of delivering for people and planet, you start to see different countries emerge. So yeah, I'm hope we've got six countries in WeGo at the moment. I'm hoping we can get one more quite soon because then we can call it the We 7 rather than the G7 and start to change the, the global <laughs> conversation about what a truly successful country is. Awesome. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot that we really need a, sh a shift in culture away from competition and more towards collaboration. Are there any other like, norms and beliefs that we need to shift from that kind of underpin capitalism at the moment that need to be spread throughout us on an individual level and culturally in society in order to get to this well-being economy? What are your thoughts on that? Should I start? So I love that you've asked that because it, it speaks to what everyone was saying at the beginning, that despite what economic textbooks tell us and despite what, I guess, political orthodoxy assumes, human beings are innate, innately caring and competitive. And yeah, you know, you know, I don't need to say this to Australians, there's a bit of competition there. <laughs> but, but we have it within us to take care of each other. And when you look at sort of neuroscience and brain scans of what makes our brains light up, it's when we're collaborating with each other, when we're in nature, when our relationships are sound. And it's psychosis to be too lonely and to be too individualised. And yet, in this society, in this GDP-rich country, one in four people are profoundly lonely. Over Well over one in three young people are, are lonely. So no wonder we're seeing this sort of crisis of mental health where Australians are one of the world's biggest users of antidepressants. And so what we have, I think, is not so much a need for a value shift, but what's happened is we've masked our innate true values because of our, the way our economic system has been designed and purposed. And so I think almost what we need to do is clear away that clutter and that economic system that's misaligned with what we really need and re-elevate those ideas of creating mechanisms to cooperate, to take care of each other, to show solidarity, to work together through things like the tool library and have our economic system in service of those goals rather than on top of and completely squashing what makes us innately human. Totally, thank you. Sabrina, did you want to add anything? Yeah, quickly, just the idea of competition is very linked to the idea of scarcity. And that's another feature of capitalism. They create scarcity. So the, the question should be, how can we live in abundance? And you know, we, we saw before the differences between Aboriginal and Western uh, entrepreneurship, right? And, uh, and I think we have, we have all the responses, you know, <laughs> the oxymoron in here is that um, we have all the responses in this land if we just listen to the Aboriginal people on, mm -hmm. you know, how we can create that things on one side. And on, on the other side, we really have to think much bigger. We have to expand our, you know, thinking. You know, I kept hearing, oh, it would be nice after COVID if we could just work four days a week, you know, instead of five. Four days. <laughs> We're not fighting until our 80s for one day less. What about reducing work in general? What about not working? What about creating new jobs that are meaningful so that we don't feel that burden, right? There's a, there's a really nice podcast called Upstreams, and it's say you don't, you don't, you know, you don't hate Mondays, you hate capitalism, right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we really need to shift our paradigm and think bigger.
Awesome. And on that note, I would love to know how did capitalism come about? How did we actually get here? Because in order to fix it as well, we also need to understand. Oh, man. <laughs> it's, it's a <laughs> big mean, question. It's a big yeah. question, but in a nutshell, Sabrina. Yeah, so I should say that when we misinterpret history, you know, with quick facts, you know, it, it might not be beneficial. But I will point out to a book that explains this really well, which is a. Uh, uh, do less with more, how deep growth can save the world of Jason Hickel. And it shows how, you know, we have often these jumps in histories because we get taught what we get taught in, you know, uh, um, Western uh, uh, school systems. We have this idea that we went, you know, from feudalism and, you know, that kind of domination and to capitalism and capitalism saved us. And he shows that in between periods, we had moment where the common existed, right? And, and then there has been an enclosure of the commons because otherwise, as he points out, it doesn't make sense that we went from a very, you know, dominant system to another dominant system. Why would the ruling class, you know, just change, you know? So at a certain point in between these, uh, he, historic events. We had the commons, we had peasants producing for the communities and for their needs and not for capital. So I really yeah, invite you to, he's an anthropologist, Jason Hickel, so he could probably run you <laughs> through the history better than myself. Fantastic, thank you. I'm just gonna jump into Hoover now. Um, the top voted question is, how can venture capitalists be better allies? There is less than 1% of POC founders globally that receive investment. It's even lower, 0.03% women of color founders receive investment in Australia. Any thoughts? Well, <laughs> so, I mean, it's essentially about injecting the basic start funding to the sort of enterprises that we need, we need more of. And I think there's tentative steps towards that. If you think of the financial system almost like the plumbing, or maybe more politely, the, the energy into the sort of ac economic activities that we need more of to create the sort of economic ecosystems that, that we need, then we've got to almost think about what sort of businesses do we want operating? Um, do, we, do we want businesses that are inherently extractive, or do we want ones where leadership are uh, people of colour, women, First Nations communities. And so I think it's just about as basic as being more deliberate in those, in those choices. People with those financial resources enabled to make those decisions where that money flows are incredibly, incredibly powerful because these decisions are so often happen behind closed doors and they, they shape, they start to bend the makeup of the economy and then all the outputs and outcomes that, that flow from that. And so having those conversations around what do we need to nurture? What sort of businesses do we want to receive that funding is vital? And there are a couple of good examples. I mean, there's the the ESG world, and it's fraught and contested, and the definitions and the allegations, quite rightly, of greenwashing or wellbeing washing and so on are quite right. But there are some of the more cutting edge, bold thinkers in the ESG movement are starting to say we need to go beyond quarters in how we judge the success of a firm. They're even saying, how do we go beyond financial returns? And I think that conversation could be game changing because at the moment, when you have people who have enough wealth to be a venture capitalist, but you still want financial returns, we're essentially adding to economic inequality. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen any ESG solution that's got an answer to that yet, unless we're really starting to say the returns are not financial. They are about, it's Tim Jackson, one of my intellectual heroes, talks about we need to see investment as commitment, commitment to the sort of economic activities that we need in the 21st century, rather than a route to rent seek and get more financial wealth for yourself. Yeah, just add quickly, yeah, I don't think even venture capitalists should exist. And, and the idea being that when they invest in something, they want a return. And the only way to have that return is you're cutting through, you know, wages or some resources. You might produce your clothes in a global south country rather than here because you have to get that 5% return. So I think that we need to look at alternative banking systems that a lot of African countries and indigenous population have. And I will, again, invite you to go on the Post Growth Institute uh, website 
because it describes some uh, alternative banking system, which means like, for example, groups of communities of women coming together, everyone putting you know, some resources on the table, one member of that group then can go and you know, use that resource in terms of money or other things, and then you know, the, the wealth is kept within the community. So yeah, just uh, I, we personally refused any investment in the tool library, and so because we wanted to be not for profit. Don't get me wrong, not for, not, not for profit doesn't mean volunteering for life. We have to find business models. That they create revenue, they create wages, they provide for the people that you know make the economic activity. But that doesn't mean that a surplus should remain there, and that that surplus should go into the pocket of someone rather than someone else. Mm -hmm. And the best, thing, one of the best, most cutting edge thinkers on that space is another colleague of yours, the Post Growth, Growth Institute, amazing woman called Jennifer Hinton, mm -hmm. who's just finished her PhD looking at the not-for-profit business model and how that sort of profit motive in and of itself leads to quite destructive choices being made by firms. So she's got a great website and she's, she's amazing. Awesome. Right, well, we're at time at the moment, so unfortunately we've got to cut it off here. But I just want to give you a massive round of applause. Like, thank you so much.